This event was started by President Yates in, in 1997, and for me at least, this event has become an important part of the rhythm of life on our campus. It celebrates, heralds in the start of another academic year, and, and the start of those years are always very busy, and, and yet with all of the things that go on and all of the groups that are involved in, in putting these events together, I can't think of another group that puts in more time, more preparation, performs at more events than, and, and I'm sure you'll excuse me for my bias in this next statement, than the country's best marching band. So I'm going to start out by talking about a student. Um, her name is Allison. She is perhaps not uh, a completely typical student. She's a bit older than average, is employed full-time, works a 40-plus hour week. Um, and in fact, she's employed at CSU, uses her employee study privilege to pull together the, the cost of her credits here at the university. Because she's employed full-time and she's in graduate school, she hasn't been eligible for uh, stipends through the department or the college, but she's working with her major professor, pulled together some grant activities that have allowed her to present her science at various places. And over the past five years, in the, in the face of working uh, a full-time job, she has maintained a 4.0 GPA, and this past May, she graduated with her PhD. Now, Allison Stoven O'Connor was and is the Larimer County Horticulture Extension Agent. And I believe that what she has done, working with her major professor, Tony Kosky, is absolutely nothing short of amazing. And I think she deserves another round of applause. Now, I start out talking about Allison, and I'm going to come back to you in a minute, so don't leave. That would be really awkward for both of us. Um, I start out talking about Allison because I want to talk about time, about five years of time, to be exact. Five years can be an incredibly important period, certainly in the life of a student and also in the life of our university. I prepare um, in the coming months to start my seventh year as the president of Colorado State University, and I'm reminded that it's five years ago this month that was where I um, had my inauguration here on the Oval. I remember it was a lot hotter that day, so we don't have that going for us this time. I remember I talked too long, and I suspect I have not learned from that lesson. So, um, I recall that we talked primarily about two things. We talked a bit about the foundational, the fundamental purposes of the university, the creation of new knowledge, extending that knowledge across our borders for the benefit of society and paying attention to students, students with talent, motivation, and limitless potential, students like Allison. But we also talked about the daunting challenges that we faced. And I think it, it's sometimes hard to go back and see those challenges today the way we saw them then. We know now how many of those stories ended, but at the time, without knowing where those paths would lead, I think we could agree that it was a frightening time. We talked about the deepening economic and debt crisis that was before us, about the widening gap between this country's haves and have-nots that tugged at the fabric of our society. We talked about ongoing wars, religious tensions around the country and the world. And we acknowledged that seeing the future clearly through the darkness that was at the bottom of the abyss on which we as a society collectively stood was not an easy thing to do. The urge to crawl under the covers and hide in those days was very real. And yet this university stood up on its feet, looked that uncertain future directly in the eye, focused on our fundamentals, and embarked on a period of extraordinary progress. I hope that you will forgive me for reading these next segments, but there is so much over the last five years that you have all accomplished as a university that I want to make sure that I don't miss a bit of this. Now keep in mind that for context, these accomplishments occurred against a backdrop of a one-third decrease in our state support. During this time, our four-year graduation rate increased by 14 percent, putting us well on the path to attain a stretch goal we announced at one of these fall addresses 
with an 80% six-year graduation rate. Alan Lamborn, Paul Thayer, Blanche Hughes, and many other people deserve a great deal of thanks for that hard work. Our first-year retention rate is now up to almost 87%, including the single largest one-year increase in CSU's history, and that occurred last year. Thanks to Lynn Johnson, Rick Miranda, and our Council of Deans, we kept our eye on the ball, seeing 30% increases in academic and student support expenditures while remaining flat in administration and, and, and seeing cuts in other areas. In the face of those financial challenges, we added six new academic departments or special academic units, 13 new graduate degrees, 12 new undergraduate majors, and 17 new undergraduate minors. We grew the total faculty of the university 13% to keep pace with consecutive years of record enrollment, and while we did that, we saw a 13% increase in women tenure-track faculty and a 17% increase in minority tenure-track faculty. 59% of our classes today have 30 students or fewer, and our student-to-faculty ratio has been maintained at around 17 to 1. Now, we did a lot of that through the hiring of adjunct faculty, and we took advantage of that opportunity to, in some ways, become something of a national leader in adjunct faculty issues. But, and I will come back to this later, we all need to acknowledge that there is a tremendous amount more of work to do around our adjunct faculty, and Dan Bush, Jen Aberly, um, Mary Stromberger and a faculty council all deserve a great deal of credit for the work they're putting in on this effort. We seized the opportunity that was provided by the construction environment and under Amy Parsons' leadership, we've built a campus that will serve this university for generations to come. We've added 1.3 million gross square feet of space at a cost of slightly over a half a billion dollars, over 60% of which was directly attributable to academic instruction. In the past five years, we've built the first new academic classrooms in decades, uh, created exceptional new living learning communities, and took every general assignment classroom on this campus and made them technology-enabled smart classrooms, and Pat Burns and his people will make exceptional use of that technology. We've done all of this, as I mentioned, in the face of a challenging fiscal environment, and there is no doubt that while our elected officials struggled to make difficult choices on, on our behalf, we also had some ways to mitigate those issues. The 30% decline in state support was translated nearly dollar for dollar by tuition increases. And those were increases that have created challenges for us as an institution, just as they have created challenges across this country. But I am proud of how we've managed through those challenges. In the very early days, before we knew how the recession would end, we launched a very innovative program called the Commitment to Colorado that has allowed us to retain our same percentage of low-income and first-generation students that we had before the economic downturn. This institution committed to a 150 percent 58% increase in institutional need-based financial aid. We've seen an 80% increase in foundation-funded scholarships and total annual financial aid at this institution under Robin Brown and her team's leadership has increased by $27 million over five years. This year's entering class will be, if not the most diverse in the history of the university, among the most diverse. And that's a trend we've also seen over these past five years. And Mary Antiveros and all the people who work around those diversity issues on our campus deserve thanks for that as well. Research was no exception to this progress. The most recent National Science Foundation higher education R&D survey, irrespective of whether a university had a medical school, irrespective of classifications, put CSU in the top percent of all universities in the country, an all-time high for our institution that reflects the tremendous productivity of our faculty and seven consecutive years of research expenditures in excess of $300 million. Externally funded awards last year were up by 14%, and private sector funded awards, an area where we knew we needed to improve, increased by nearly a quarter. And under Alan Rudolph's leadership for that area, we expect those great things to continue. CSU has continued to improve in its top of mind awareness, thanks to the work of Tom Milligan and his external relations team as we survey people across Colorado, and our engagement across the borders of this campus under Lou Swanson and Cathay Reynolds' leadership has continued to grow. We now serve every county in the state of Colorado through our extension programs and flipping the extension model so that citizens determine the services that they wish to, to receive has been very popular. And we've seen, despite the financial challenges that our partners, the county commissioners, and we have had to managed through as we faced financial downturns, we've seen a 4% increase in the satisfaction of our county commissioners in our extension services, and that started from a very high number. Thanks to the leadership of many people, Carol Dollard, Tony Miyamoto, Brian Dunbar, Ron Sega, Amy Parsons, and many others, 
our campus continues to rank as the most sustainable university in the country as measured in the nation's premier analysis of higher education sustainability. Under Jim Cooney's leadership, we transformed a vision for internationalizing our campus from words on paper to a reality, offering exciting new international partnerships, expanded opportunities for global research and collaboration, and we've seen a dramatic increase in the number of international students who come here and enrich the life of our community. We have seen, perhaps most remarkably, a 147% increase in annual private giving under the leadership of Brett Anderson and his team. This year, we saw a record high of $143.3 million in private support for Colorado State University. We've seen record numbers of alumni engagement, record numbers of new donors, and in five years, thanks to all that hard work, we have been able to increase the number of scholarships we offer to our students by more than 200. We've endowed four new faculty chairs, and we've launched the first two presidential endowed chairs in the history of Colorado State University. Now that track record, I would suggest to you, is remarkable during any time period. But against the backdrop of these last five years, I would suggest to you that it is extraordinary. And I hope you are as proud of what we have accomplished as a university as I am proud of you. Now each of those numbers, as proud as we are of them, are data points. But behind each of those data points are stories, wonderful stories about a community, about our community, that refused to settle, even though we had every excuse to do so, refused to settle for anything less than excellence in everything that we do as an institution. And because that approach was taken, we now have the opportunity to turn our attention, as we should, to the future. Now, I can't stand here before you today and predict that our signs will stay standing for the next five years. You okay, Sam? <laughs> it would be the first in a fall address to lose an ASCSU president during the speech. And I would just assume that didn't happen to him. I can't stand before you today and tell you that I believe the future that we face is without challenge. All of you have heard me say that I believe the greatest challenge of our day is determining the, the answer to the riddle of how we will fund American public higher education. This is a challenge to which I believe our answer will, in part, help define how history recalls our generation. But that is a long-term challenge, a chronic problem. And as we and our elected officials struggle with it, we acknowledge that it waxes and wanes. And I can stand here before you today and say that I do not see the specific problems that we anticipate we'll face in the next five years as being similar to what we faced in, in the last five. I think we have already passed through worse than we will see. And in that observation lies an opportunity. We have the chance to choose now how we will approach the next five years. Now there's a school of thought that says this would be a good time to consolidate our gains, solidify what we've done around our successes, and there's a lot to recommend this line of thinking. We pause far too seldom to celebrate the sort of amazing successes I've been talking about. Five years will go by in the blink of an eye, and we'll be standing here in 2019 on the eve of CSU's 150th birthday, and we should do that after a period of careful planning with our reserves replenished, and our batteries fully charged. And yet that does not sound like CSU to me. This university has never used phrases like good enough or good enough for now. This university is composed of people who finish the task at hand, wipe the sweat off their brow, roll up their sleeves, look around and ask, what's next? This university has an extraordinary legacy built by people of enormous courage who refused to settle for the status quo. People like John Mosley who came to Colorado A&M despite the fact that he couldn't stay in the same hotels with his football teammates because he was black. He went on to become a legend in the Tuskegee Airmen, not the status quo. Polly Baca took the questions that she had about why she couldn't sit where she wanted in her church, combined them with her motivation in a Colorado State University education, and became the first Latina ever elected to a state house of representatives, not the status quo. 
Maury Albertson, a Colorado State University Founders Day medal recipient, translated his vision for how young men and women could serve our world into a blueprint for the Peace Corps, absolutely not the status quo. But CSU is more than that legacy. CSU is people who today, every day, continue to inspire us with their humanity. People like our wonderful colleague, Tom Sutherland, another Founders Day medal recipient, who endured captivity in Beirut and emerged with an intact sense of optimism about a world built on a foundation of peace. People like alumnus Dennis Rep and our dear friends Dave and Gail Linegar, whose extraordinary generosity allows countless numbers of veterans to return from combat to this campus, complete their educations, and give back to our country in a different way. And people like three extraordinary alumna. Allison Stoven O'Connor, who has demonstrated to us how to take that most limited resource we have, time, and translate it into another gift, education, that in turn gives to others through the benefit to our society. Becky Hammond, who continues to shatter glass ceilings for women in the world of sport. And Amy Ruin Van Dyken, whose courage simply takes away our breath and our excuses. And yet, CSU is also people whose names we do not yet know. They'll come from the Eastern Plains, from the Western Slope, the, the Front Range Urban Corridor. They will be black, white, brown, yellow, red, male, female. They will have absolutely nothing in common except for one small thing. They will come with the desire to improve their lives and our world in the process. We owe it to them and to all who came before them to make this the best land-grant university that this can be. Land-grant universities, you see, are so important because they were an important part serving, in my mind at least, as an incubator for the American dream. In this country, you can be whatever your ability takes you to be. You can become anything. And access to a world-class education has always been an important part of that. But too often in the last five years, too many of our citizens have felt that that dream has been foreclosed, pushed beyond their reach. Perhaps the greatest damage from the Great Recession was not the erosion of our economy, but the erosion of our sense of hope and optimism. And one of the best tools to rebuild that sense of hope and optimism is a healthy, vibrant, land-grant university system. When we push ourselves, when we push our institution to be better, we, in effect, push a bellows that fans a flame that reignites a fire that warms an incubator for the American dream. Can we rest while there are students who are not attaining their potential? Can we pause when we see an opportunity to further the creative environment of discovery on this campus? Can we sit back and relax when we see how there are opportunities to take great programs to exceptional ones? Can we continue to tolerate an environment where too many of our students fail to see role models like themselves in the front of our classrooms and in our leadership positions because we, have an as an institution, have failed to reflect the society that we exist to serve? Can we turn away from the inequities that we know our adjunct colleagues still face on a daily basis? Can we celebrate, even for a moment, when we know that our women colleagues do not face the same environment that we men take for granted. An environment that we would characterize as fair and equitable, but which is so far from that in many of their situations that in, at times, even in fundamental ways such as the freedom from fear, there is a difference for them than for us. Will we continue to accept the loss of opportunity and human potential that comes with each year that we fail to address these issues. Lincoln said, and, and I'll quote, every effect must have its cause. The past is the cause of our present, and our present will be the cause of our future. These are all connected as links in an endless chain from the finite to the infinite." Close quote. 
the successes that we celebrate here today are the result of work that's already been done, just as the challenges that we face today are the result of work that we have left undone. If we want our legacy at this university to be one characterized more by achievements and less by regret, then we must acknowledge that in the next five years, we have a lot more work to do. Now, my father used to say that talking shouldn't be a verb because it doesn't actually do anything. And I suspect if he were here, he would say that about 20 minutes ago, I should have stopped talking so that this university could get on with the work that we know stands before us. But I think we should be clear on this point. I think we should make no mistake. The problems that we are talking about are not new, and they are not simple. And the work that it will take to solve them is not work that will be done in committee. This is work that will be done in the individual quiet of the human heart. This is work that will be done by each of us. Each time that we look around and answer the questions, is there work to be done with yes, when should it begin with now, and who should get it started with me? I can tell you that there is no one I would rather face these questions with than all of you the people who are Colorado State University. I have had the privilege of working alongside of you for over 21 years now, and I thank you for that honor. And I can tell you that because I feel I know you well, I have great confidence in how this university will answer those questions five years from now. Let's have another great year, CSU, and go Rams!